to write me. Black Power. What's going on, comrades? Black Power, Robert. And to our other viewers that are on right now, Black Power, Muhammadu. Black Power. Black Power. Y'all come on in the room. Black Power, Ghazi. Black Power. Black Power, Kimya. Black Power, Karina. Black Power, what's going on, comrades? Come on in the room, come on in the room. Happy Sunday, fun day to you all. Yay, finally. <laughs> Girl, don't try it. Black Power, Daniel. Yes, you better watch from the plantation, Robert. Black Power, Aaliyah, probably in the kitchen right behind us. <laughs> Black Power Window, I'm always messing up his name. Black Power Histopher. Welcome, 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 y'all. Look who's here with me. <laughs> All right, y'all, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And I first want to say welcome and thank you for tuning in to the Revolutionary Book Club with myself, Chief Dia. And I'm so proud to announce that now going forward, every other, every other Sunday, excuse me, I'll be joined by Comrade Naya. Black Power. Black Power. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, uh, as being a member of Black Hammer, you know, we really want to, well, not that we want to, but we really believe in the leadership of African women. And, you know, I we just knew that Naya being on the Revolutionary Book Club would be a great addition. And we get to, you know, get political education from an African woman's point of view. So, Comrade Naya, is there anything you would like to say? Well, <laughs> I am happy to be here. Um, this is dope. Um, I'm happy to be here with you. Um, and I'm happy to be um, joining um, such a revolutionary part of this organization that brings um, like political education and um, just revolutionary science to the people. Mm -hmm. And to be just helping to get that out there. So. <laughs> Black power, y'all. So I'm not going to be on here rambling by myself anymore. <laughs> I got my comrade with me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we got some very exciting things coming up for the Revolutionary Book Club. You know, you're going to be start seeing us in different locations. We're looking at different um, black-owned bookstores to go and do the bookstore. I mean, the bookstore, the book club in. So it's really, we about to take it to a whole nother level. So stick with us, okay? So, uh, for today's show, as you all know, we are still on the autobiography, autobiography of Asada. Asada, not about autobiography. For, so, today, we're going to be reviewing chapters 13 through 15. Mm -hmm. And look how much of the book we have left, y'all. Like, we have really been getting through this thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's just been so, you know, so wonderful to get to know Conrad Asada in this way and you know if I'm being frank like I didn't really know too much about you know Conrad Asada until now and it's just been great what about you Conrad um this is my second time reading this book Dang. and I, <laughs> but I read it three years ago okay. and so the first time I read it I got a lot out of it but I wasn't where I am now so yeah. reading it now is it's a lot of things that I didn't really understand the first time reading yeah. it through. So I've, I've enjoyed this analysis that we've been doing and mm. just reading it through again to just have a basic understanding, especially having some experience being in a, you know, revolutionary party and organization. Yeah. Um, so I really enjoyed yeah. going through this again. Right on. So um, before we start, you know, we got to come through with our announcements. And I just really want to give a salute and a shout out to our comrades, Gigi and Robert, who in Orlando did a fantastic uh, food drive yesterday. 
that was very successful. Shout out to those comrades Salute, for doing Salute. that. Black Power. And I also want to let you guys know that um, if you're here in Atlanta, Black Hammer will be at the Atlanta Pride this year. Um, so we'll be speaking at the 9th Annual LGBT Greek Brunch, which is going to be on that Saturday. Um, August 31st at 11 a.m. Um, so we'll be speaking there and then later on that afternoon at 2 p.m. We'll be having a workshop at uh, the No Hate Campaign event that they're having on that Saturday um, as well and that's at um, That's at 2 o'clock and then on Saturday we'll be um, at the what is it called? I'm not, I can't remember what it's called, but it's going to be um, some performances, like they're doing something in the park, and we'll be there too. I'm actually waiting for one of the Candler main... Park. What, what Candler Park. Candler Park. Candler Park? Okay. Candler Park. Yeah, so we'll be there. I'll be singing. Guys will be speaking. You know, comrades will be there. We'll be collecting contacts and stuff like that. So, if you, again, if you're here in Atlanta and you want to meet the Chiefs, you know, say what's up, get to know more about the organization, you definitely can... Um, come out and see us so black power daniel yes well we comrade we'll figure out how to get you here don't worry about it so <laughs> all right y'all so um hashtag what's on your bookshelf we want to know right here in the comments um you know what are you guys reading right now currently what books are you yeah what books are you reading right now what books do you have on your uh bookshelf obviously right now we're doing um Asada, not a biography. But yeah, we want to know what you're reading so, you know, we can expand on our, uh, you know, expand on our book horizons. Black Power, is that Corel? Coriel. Coriel? Coriel Amad. Child, you know I can butcher some damn names. Black now. Power. <laughs> Teaching Bible to All right, so let's get started in the first chapter. Obviously, we're going to be doing is chapter 13. And, um, you know, upon the beginning of the chapter, I think, you know, she's doing a re her response to the assassination of mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Jr. And, you know, she's just speaking about her anger, you know, about how this is making not only her, but all the black people that she see, how it's making them feel, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because I believe she says that she was on the subway or something like that. And something that she says in the beginning that really was powerful to me. And let me see if I can find it. She says, um, see, this is what I need to highlight. What did she say? I know what stood out to me mm -hmm. in that little section is when it sounds to me like, you know, she's noticing that many of the leaders that were in the revolution or it you know doing something to fight for black people yeah. were murdered and yeah. especially if they were deemed as a threat mm -hmm. she stated uh the tonic abstract revolution um i'm tired of watching us lose they kill our leaders then they kill us for protesting protest yes. protest revolution if it exists I want to find it bulletins uh bulletins more bulletins i'm tired of bulletins i want bullets right that's what <laughs> yeah okay so I, that now that was powerful that was really powerful but also when she says um dang smashing windows will do me no good i'm beyond that i want blood mm -hmm. like yes. that's some real ass shit like seriously you know um so she is talking about that and she's also talking about how after she graduated from Manhattan Community College, mm -hmm. she got married. Did yeah. you know that? I forget that because it just <laughs> seems so, it almost yeah. like it's so significant. Like she really didn't talk about yeah, it. Yeah, not like, at all. And yeah. I mean, even just reading this chapter, just when she speaks about it, it's just like that. It's not something that she elaborates on. And then what I also can appreciate about Comrade Asada is that, you know, throughout this whole entire book, up until this point, she speaks about how much of a slob she is, like how disorganized she is. And, you know, also when I was thinking about that, I just realized that she's a cancer. Yeah. And I'm a cancer. Yeah. And cancers are messy as hell. No shade. I try, I try to keep it clean, you know, but... <laughs> she just talks about, you know, how she met this African man and it was, you know, they were caught up in the revolutionary fever and just how the fact that, you know... 
you think that when you're a revolutionary and you find another revolutionary, mm -hmm. it's automatically going to be some uh, this match made in heaven. But right, not necessarily. Though. No, <laughs> <laughs> Black Power Valencia. You know, she just talks about um, you know how she wasn't able to do much around the house and stuff like that. Right. You know. Um, so uh, yeah, what a you did you see anything else that was interesting for you in chapter 13 yeah um well she's uh you know getting into organizing and yeah. getting uh, very interested in organizing mm -hmm. and then she's defining the word uh revolution and she said that then that i guess uh, people were using the word revolution because it was in and people were talking yeah. about kind of like now mm -hmm. like everybody's always oh, you know hip to be woke yeah you know, and stuff like that <laughs> I, you know, purposely try to, you know, stay away from that word. But yeah. she had mentioned that um, people were using revolution kind of because it sounded hip. And um, she had mentioned Malcolm said that, you know, she actually defined the word revolution and what it meant for her. Um, she said Malcolm said it meant bloodshed and land. Um, but then to, she said, to me, revolutionary struggle of black people had to be against racism, capitalism, imperialism, and sexism for real freedom under a socialist government. So um, that... To me, especially with her being, I mean, as young as she was and mm -hmm. going into it, seeing what she was seeing and how our leaders were being murdered. And then just, you know, looking at it in the sense that revolution is not just something where it's like you're a bunch of black people running around with guns yeah. and stuff like that. It's like, what? Are, why are we doing this mm -hmm. in the first place? What is it connected to? Mm -hmm. Like, what to what end? Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, at this point... You know, it's almost like we're watching Asada, we're witnessing Asada, you know, ascend into this, right. her revolutionary life. Um, she also speaks about um, how she researches a bunch of different revolutionary groups. Yeah. Um, she was looking for the uh, the red, uh, the red, what is what The is red called? guard. The red, the red guard. guard. Yep. The ch 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 Chicanos, is that what Chicanos. it is? Chicanos, yeah, there were several of them that she mentioned. The Red Guard, I believe it was the Chicanos. Mm -hmm. uh, she couldn't find the Red Guard for the longest yeah. and then kind of ran into them. By accident. Yeah. After. Yeah. Now, Asada <laughs> <laughs> was in the park smoking on some trees mm -hmm. with some of her and her homegirls and homeboys um and it was this guy well two guys that were attacked by the pigs for having these leaflets you know on them right. and they you know she they were so high and like in shock that they couldn't really respond in the way that they wanted to Absolutely. And that's how she was, because she was like, they gave her an address to where the Red Guard might be, but even after going to Chinatown, her and her ride that she came with, they actually got lost and couldn't, and they didn't end up finding um, anyone. Right. And also, another great thing about this chapter is when uh, she speaks about being a first aid uh, assistant, mm -hmm. um, where she was going to um, Alcatraz, which is... Um, you know, well, obviously we know that all of the land here in this country belongs to the indigenous people, but Alcatraz, at this point in time, um, you know, when she was going to help this doctor, there were different demonstrations going on by the Native American, the indigenous people of this land. And right. she was just speaking about how she saw so many different tribes, the, the strength of these people, you know, that was here at this prison doing these demonstrations. And she also speaks about how the correlations between, you know, Native uh, Native Americans here in this country in the struggle of African people. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that was really powerful. That was. And, I mean, it just links colonized people all over the globe who mm -hmm. have um, struggled to um, keep their culture, you know, their culture intact and then being forced with having to, <laughs> I mean, fight to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really powerful as well. Yeah. Um, and also another good uh, another um, good thing is that when she speaks, because you we hear about we were taught in school that you know Native Americans would scout you know different tribes you know that they were warring with and different things of that nature. But Conrad Asada lays out in the book that scalping, like the actual you know the the act of scalping, started with Europeans. Europeans. 
Europeans mm-hmm. started doing that, you know, and even they did it, you know, when um when they were coming to the new world or whatever and you know the the hierarchy would send out orders to if you bring back this many scouts then you'll be paid this much. But Asada even says that in the book um that uh Native Americans didn't start scalping other Native Americans until like a hundred years afterwards. And um you know she says that and I quote, you'll never find true history in the books. Nope. You'll sure. never find the true history in the books. So that was very, very powerful for me. Yeah. And it just yeah. lays out also the fact that so many, uh, what people would deem to be savage and mm-hmm. you know, things like cannibalism, they try to tie it to African culture yeah. and um, indigenous cultures. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, when you actually go out and do research mm-hmm. in real history, like she was doing, uh, you'll learn that your, you know, African culture, your indigenous cultures has so many other rich things that, mm-hmm. but the things that people tie to it is usually, mm-hmm. <laughs> somehow you can, you can link it back to European culture. Yeah, right, right. And then they do it in an effort to want to make you want to disassociate yourself with it, you know, just like how we see traditional African religious um, religion or spirituality, Absolutely. you know, how it's been demonized um, you know, by white media, you know, mm. they, like you said, like cannibalism and all of this other type of stuff like that. And then we get the idea that we not, you know, what the fuck is that type yeah. of shit and all this other kind of stuff like that. They take it and twist it and make it so grotesque that you don't want to have, have to anything to do with it. And it, it was just, it was really <laughs> nice to see, um, Comrade Asada allude to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything else, um, that you want to point out? Um, yeah, I have a lot of highlights okay. here. Um, <clears throat> so we talked about this already where they got busted and everything yeah, like that. And yeah. Just remaining alert and when mm-hmm. you're out and doing the work. Uh, let's see. One of the most important things that the party did was to, and this is coming from page 203, <clears throat> one of the most important things that the party did was to make it really clear who the enemy was, not the white people, but the capitalistic imperialist impressor, uh, mm-hmm. oppressors. They took the black liberation struggle out of national context and put it in an international context. Uh, context. The party supported revolutionary struggles in governments all over the world and, uh, and assisted, insisted the U.S. get out of Africa, out of Asia, and out of Latin America and out of the ghetto, too. Um, this is, I guess, before she had officially joined, joined the party, yeah. but she was just trying to figure out kind of like what they were doing before she actually committed to joining. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, I thought that was good that she was like actually researching and not just joining it because it looked good because she said she had seen them do a lot of things and she was interested in what they had to say yeah. but she just I mean she was really looking at their their ide- their ideology mm-hmm. and I um, I like that she did that before she just jumped, kind of jumped in, in. Yeah. yeah so um, I like you and another part when she's speaking about the pan uh the Panthers and it made me think of Black Hammer and I was like uh-huh. that's us. <laughs> and she was like, uh, when she says the party was more than bad, it was bodacious. The sheer audacity of walking onto the California Senate floor with rifles demanding that black people have the right to bear arms and the right to self defense mm-hmm. made me sit back and take a long look at them. And this is when it was really like this is Black Hammer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the more political I became, the more I appreciated it. The Panthers didn't try to sound all intellectual, mm-hmm. talking about the national bourgeoisie, the military industrial complex, the reactionary ruling class. They simply called a pig a pig. Mm-hmm. They didn't refer to the repressive domestic army or the state repressive apparatus. They called the racist police pigs and racist dogs. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's Black Hammer all day. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so now we're going to get into our hashtag read that back portions of um, chapter 13. And for me, um, my hashtag read that back um, part for chapter 13 um, is when, you know, Comrade Asada, again, is looking for the Red Guard. She's trying to find the Red Guard. And mm-hmm. um, she's with this brother who took her to um, who took her to Chinatown and they ended up getting lost. So after they got lost, they ended up going to this Chinese restaurant, you know, just to eat and, you know, talk, you know, being that they couldn't find the Red Guard. But 
Um, so I'm going to read what she says. Um, finding the Red Guard was not easy at all. Half the people I ran into had never heard of them, and the other half only had a minimal knowledge of who they were and what they were all about. Oh, hold on, wait, no, that's not where it starts at. Okay, 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 okay. So we ended up getting lost. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's page 200. I'm on page 200. So she says, um, we ended up getting lost and never did find the address. Instead, we ended up eating at a Chinese restaurant and getting into a big debate. He couldn't understand why a black woman wanted to hook up with Chinese revolutionaries in the first place. Ain't nobody gonna free black folks but black folks. Those Chinese don't give a damn about you and me. All they care about is their own people and what's going on in China. Hmm. I told him that I thought there were a whole lot of us in the same predicament and that the only way we were going to get out of it was to come together and to break the chains. The brother looked at me as if I was spouting empty rhetoric. Some of the laws of revolution are so simple they seem impossible. People think that in order for something to work it has to be complicated, but a lot of the times but a lot of times the opposite is true. We usually reach success by putting the simple truths that we know into practice. The basis of any struggle is people coming together to fight against a common enemy. And you know, that was very powerful for me, you know, just in regards that, you know, we understand that first of all, revolution is a process. And you know, like Comrade Asada says that, you know, um, we're not, we're the, the, the colonized people of the world, you know, African people, um, indigenous people, you know, all of these different um, countries that have been dominated by white power who have been, you know, um, you know, just brutalized and has experienced this, you know, genocide at the hands of white imperialism, right. you know, that is, this is, that's the answer, you know, to overturning this thing for us to unite. And we understand that, you know, each, um, each proletariat may have its own um, nuances and different things of that nature, you know, in terms of like where they're located, the history of imperialism in that country and, you know, what have, um, may have taken place. But, you know, we understand that for everybody to be free, for all of us to be free of uh, colonialism, of imperialism, we have to unite together. And, you know, uniting could mean solidarity and supporting the indigenous people of this That's land, right. supporting, you know, the indigenous people of Palestine, you know, Iraq, Iran, you know, all of those different places where we see imperialism just being rampant, you know, it would be backwards to think that, you know, just because we're African people that we wouldn't be able to, you know, work with the indigenous people of the Americas or, you know, things like that. So that was very, um, that was very powerful for me. So that was my hashtag read that back part for chapter 13. Well, I had, um, <clears throat> excuse me, several. I have this one that's uh, very, uh, to me, is very powerful. Um, and just, like, I guess self-accountability mm -hmm. uh, to get involved with the struggle. Because I know a lot of people, they feel like, well, what can I do? Or why should I be get involved? Or what, you know, what is it that, you know, we've, we haven't already tried? Mm -hmm. But she says on page 207, towards the end of the chapter, if you're deaf, dumb, and blind to what's happening in the world, you're under no obligation to do anything. <laughs> but if you know what's happening and you don't do anything but sit on your ass, then you, you are, are nothing punk. but a punk. <laughs> I like to prefer, I don't know if I should say it. Girl, bitch, <laughs> okay. you a bitch oh, ass nigga, something. <laughs> but, um, but that's, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and then tying back to the beginning of the chapter where she had mentioned that, you know, one, like what happened to Martin Luther King and then several other revolutionary leaders, mm -hmm. there was that one case that we've all seen or that was highly publicized that pushed us into getting involved. Yeah. And I think for me, it was a it was a combination. I think it was, uh, you know, Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. uh, Sandra Bland. Um, it was, uh, you know, Mike Brown. All of those. And the, the oh, how could I forget the, um, and I'm drawing a blank. Uh, but the little boy that was shot in Cleveland, Ohio by the pigs. He was playing on in the playground. Park? Yeah. Okay. His name starts with a, a T. Tamir. Tamir Rice. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, 
that was it for me because I'm just like I'm I can't just sit here and do nothing while mm-hmm. this shit is happening to my people and then it's just you know and so that rang true to me because I think that something within you has to know that it just the moral if you have a moral compass at all mm-hmm. that you can't just sit by idly while this planet is being destroyed mm-hmm. and people are being kept from just natural resources that every life mm-hmm. form was supposed to be able to utilize yeah. and then but there's a group of people that are trying to keep it from everybody unless they get what they want and mm-hmm. you know i'm i'm done with sitting around doing that shit. Yeah. so that that rang true to me yeah black power black power so let's get into these comments to see what your hashtag read that back part was for chapter 13 but before i do that and i should have did it in the beginning i'm sorry it's in my mind but the revolutionary book club does serve as a fundraiser for black hammer and also a member drive for black hammer as well so if you look here in the comments i have pinned the links that you can go and donate you have the cash app and the gofundme um the cash app being bh book club you can send you don't donate anything that you can you can also go to gofundme.com slash black hammer uh black hammer org and it's to you know support the organization so we can do different things like do different campaigns like mm-hmm. you see with the um hashtag protect our girls campaign uh the food drive that was done in orlando on yesterday that was mm-hmm. extremely successful all of those things were able to happen because of your support and the donations that you give to black camera so we really want to appreciate everybody who has donated thus far and again please just donate whatever you can you know whatever you can so again you can go to uh Black Hammer, um, you, yeah, you can even donate at blackhammer.org, um, uh, but again, you can go to gofundme.com slash blackhammerorg, and you can also donate through Cash App at BH Book Club. So, as you can see, I got my co-host now. You don't know, one day we trying to get into a studio or something like that, so... <laughs> Um, yeah, so moving on to chapter th- uh, 14, excuse me. So now, we want to look at some of the comments. Oh, I'm sorry, back. yeah. <laughs> hashtag read that back. So we have Comrade Daniel who says, Hashtag read that back. How she broke down how simple the Black Panthers take on the pigs were. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Let's see. We also have hashtag uh, read that back. From Comrade Histopher who says, you'll be good for the party and the party will be good for you. The party is only as strong as its people. people. Yup. That's true. That is so true. Let's see if we have any other. We have Comrade Kim, your hashtag read that back. Let's see. 197, she said... I'm sorry. There you go. Second, <laughs> second to last paragraph. Back then, everyone used the word revolution just because it sounded hip. To me, the revolutionary struggle of black people had to be against um, racism, capitalism, imperialism, and sexism for, yeah, that that was powerful for me too. Real freedom under a socialist government. Yes. Absolutely, Kim. Black power. Let's see. Okay. All right. Black power, Gerald. So, um, yeah, so moving on to chapter 14. So now um, she's back speaking about her trials and everything like that. So she starts off by letting us know that she's now being moved to Manhattan Correctional Center. And it's now January 5th, 1976. And she's being moved there because of alleged bank robbery in Queens, New York. Right. So... She speaks about, you know, the correctional center, you know, just like the environment, what it's like. Um, And she also speaks about, you know, people in the prison who have done sophisticated crimes or whatever and how, you know, they get these special privileges because they pay the guards and, you know, like getting Chinese food, getting um, Italian food and all of this other type of stuff like that. Just because even in prison, if you have access to resources, you can make it do what it do, you know? So, um, you know, she speaks about that. And she also speaks about, you know, the health of the women in the prison and how, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. they don't have access to adequate health or, you know, health care and things like that. That was a little disgusting. Mm -hmm. Um, And just, it says, 
I know on page 210 it says at the time the health situation was horrible. Women came up, came in off the street and um, were given no physical exam, um, no tests, no nothing. They had trouble seeing gynecologists mm -hmm. and having their most basic needs met, medical or otherwise. Since we were a tiny minority of uh, the prison of the prison population, our needs were ignored. The women got together and wrote complaints to the warden. Charlie uh, was one of the women who worked the hardest to get better medical conditions. It's kind of ironic when I think about it now. A little more than a year later, I overheard the prison through the prison grapevine that uh, Charlene um, had died from undiagnosed cancer of the uterus. Um, I mean, and that's common. Like mm -hmm. today, um, I actually had an uncle that died in prison, and he had been sick for a while. And they ignored the situation, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I mean, these types of things. Uh, I mean, they, they're disgusting because, I mean, like, uh, you know, anything that you could need, uh, you know, you go, you're supposed to have, you know, annual breast exams. I mean, just basic care. Yeah. And they ignore it because they're like, oh, well, you're an inmate, so, you know, you lucky to get food or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's disgusting. And you know what? I, I just want to backtrack real quick, you know, just to speak in to, uh, you know, like how she's speaking about, you know, how these sophisticated criminals, you know, get all of these different mm -hmm. privileges from paying the prison guards and stuff like that. So quick story. Last night I was out doing lift. So I was, we rode by the federal prison that's here in Atlanta mm -hmm. and I had no idea. Well, well, yeah, I didn't have any idea that it was a federal prison here. And when you ride by it, it looks like a larger version of the White House, like the actual White House that the presidents are in of this country. It looks like a big ass White House. So it's this sister in the back seat, you know, that I'm driving and she was like, oh yeah, we call that the big house. You know, that's the big house. And she was like, some of the inmates are actually, they get to leave at night. Like the guards let them out of the prison at mm -hmm. night and they get back in the morning before they do the count or whatever. Wow. And, you know, I at first I had a mixed reaction to that because it was like, well, shit, they, they getting over on, you know, the prison or whatever. But then when I was able to read this, it was just like it, it creates a situation to where, you know, the brothers get almost a comfortable mm -hmm. in being in this environment because, right. you know, well, shit. What? Why do I have to try to fight the system if I can have if I can get these types of privileges? If yeah, all I you gotta, up, you right. know, all I gotta do is pay this guard or something like that, and it 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 it, it you know it it takes the fight away of mm -hmm. making you want to say, well, sh I, we gotta burn this prison down, bitch. Fuck all of that shit. I don't want to get out for just a couple of hours or whatever. And then have to come back. I want to burn this shit the fuck down. And you know that's what makes it problematic because again, if you have it, it makes you comfortable. And you get comfortable. And that was just like really, it was really unnerving to me to hear Absolutely. that. So it was yeah, that wow. was crazy. <laughs> wow. But um, so yeah, so she's right now in the Manhattan Correctional um Center, and this case is being taken on by the federal uh the federal what is it the federal court system or something like that it said federal the federal prison it said they made some comment where they said that she was the property of, of the state or something federal like that federal something yeah yeah you're the property of the feds now right so um mind you y'all she's still she hasn't been she hasn't had her court date yet for the supposed um murder of the um the murder of the uh, the, pig. the pig on the mm -hmm. turnpike. These are all of the trumped up charges that the Prior FBI, to. yes, the U.S. government has, you know, put against her. So this is just another trial that she's going through. So she talks about that in a previous chapter. I think that we reviewed um, like last week. She speaks about how they used a photo of this woman yes. that was robbing the mm -hmm. bank. And how they put her colonial name under the picture, you know, saying that it's a warrant for her and things of that nature. And then at a court date, a previous court date, they wanted to photograph her yep. just so they'll be able to line up the pictures to make it seem like it was actually it was Asada. But she didn't want to take the picture, so the pigs jumped her in her. the courtroom. Literally in the courtroom. 
So now at this, this is the bank that was in Queens, New York. So this is what she's on trial now. So at this trial, what the pigs did was try to put her photo on top of the photo of the woman to make it, uh, to make it look Why like not? her. Yeah. But they were beating her so bad. Like the picture that they took, they cropped her face out, then blocked out all of the pigs that were beating her. And she, the, 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 the picture that they was able to get, she says that she was in such anguish that it was no way in hell that they could say that that was her. Right. <laughs> I was just uh, I was just disgusted because I mean it's not surprising that those are the types of antics that they will use to mm -hmm. try to lock somebody away especially somebody who's considered a revolutionary mm -hmm. um, but yeah I you know when I mean just the fact that they beat her in open court mm -hmm. I mean that was enough like in front of everybody for people to see and then they were going to try to use what little they could get to say, oh, we're going to use this scientific forensic, you know, to, we're going to line it up and show you that this is more, most likely who, yeah. who was robbing the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's, it's comical because of the way Comrade Asada lays it out, but then right. it's very serious because you would think that, you know, the state wouldn't do you know, these simple-minded, dumbass, like, it's it's almost like petty-ass shit, mm -hmm. like, really petty yeah. to do, to try to convict, you know, Conrad Asada, but this is what the state has done, this is what the state is doing, you know, to African people who are fighting for our liberation each and every single day, mm -hmm. and um, she speaks about how they had some type of, you know, they brought this guy, the prosecution brought in some scientific evidence to say that right. it was her <laughs> in the um in the picture but she was like she said since the photo identification part of the case was based on nothing based on more than nothing than all niggas look alike mm -hmm. the FBI tried to use scientific evidence to gain a conviction their plan to uh Superimpose the bank surveillance um, photo over my photo failed because they had only one photo of me that was taken at the same angle as the bank uh, robbery picture. It was one of the photographs taken when they assaulted me in the courtroom before the trial began when I refused to let them take my picture. The FBI had blocked out the faces and hands of the marshals and FBI agents choking and assaulting me. Uh, they cro they had cropped the picture so that the only thing the jury could see was by was my face. But my facial expression in the photograph was one of such agony that it was hard for them to convince the jury of anything else. Yeah, that was that term that I was trying to think of when you mentioned super, super, yeah. super, uh, super, that's like supposed to be like a forensic type. Uh, method that they use mm -hmm. when they're trying to you know especially when they're trying to resur you know they find a skull and they're trying to okay well this has to be that person yeah. but they try to use that shit uh, <laughs> <laughs> to convict her for this mm -hmm. anything to get their case made yeah. anything to yeah and um also it was so so at this point in the in the chapter she doesn't think that she's going to, you know, win this case or whatever, win this trial or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they have their her uh her defense team was able to bring they said the court allowed them to bring in their own photographic uh forensic person or whatever you want to call it. And he was able to lay out that in fact that it was not her in the photo and she was asked she was able to get her acquittal mm -hmm. in this trial. Um, so yeah, this was, it was a very cool, I mean, just understanding the situation that Conrad Asada is in, to me, reading this chapter, it was kind of, mm, it, it, this chapter, it was kind of, um, I don't want to say that it made me happy, but it was just, it was exciting to see her, you know, beat this, you know, in this chapter. Or whatever, and also um, she worked with the Jewish a Jewish uh, lawyer uh, for right. this trial that she didn't use. Um, well, she still had Aunt Ev acting on her counsel, but the uh, the main defense was um, led by this Jewish man or whatever. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You got anything else um, before we go into the hashtag read that back? Uh, parts? no. We can go ahead and go into that. You've covered. Okay. 
So go, you can go ahead and start with yours. Well, and then we'll go to mine. I had mentioned mine to yours earlier, <laughs> yeah. earlier but mine is the one where uh, during the court hearing, uh, it says one little, this is coming from page 212, mm -hmm. one little girl broke up the whole courtroom when she asked out loud, is that the Foss's pig, mommy? <laughs> pointing, to the, pointing at the judge. And mm -hmm. it was as if black folks had just taken over the courtroom, letting everybody know that they were just watching what was going down. Yes. And so I, that, I like that because, um, I, you know, I've, I'm teaching my child right now. He's five, and five-year-olds mostly say whatever the hell is on their mind. Mm -hmm. And when when it's apparent that they they are already getting the lowdown on what the system is doing, my my son knows not to trust no <laughs> no pigs. He's not gonna trust no pigs. Um, but it's just more so like you got to start early, mm -hmm. letting your letting your kids know seriously about what the system it has in store for them. Um, and so that stood out to me because whoever's kid that was, mama was already giving them the, the business. Period. Yeah. <laughs> so. so my hashtag, ooh, excuse me, uh, my hashtag read that back part comes on page 210. Um, you know, and again, you know, in this chapter, she's speaking about how she, uh, how she's moved to this, to the Manhattan, um, correctional, um, center. And she speaks about running into two sisters that she had met previously mm -hmm. in another, uh, in another prison before she got here. And it's the sister, um, by the name of, uh, Charlene. But she, you know, they call her uh, Charlie, Charlie, and you was actually speaking about her earlier. But um, so it says, um, hashtag read that back. She was bitter and tired, and her whole attitude can be summed up in two words she frequently used, shove it. She told me that her freedom depended on whether or not she passed a high school uh E mm. equi equi equivalency, equivalency test. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody encouraged her to study, but she didn't. But she just didn't seem to care anymore. She said that she was tired of jumping through hoops and didn't give a damn what happened. Mm -hmm. I understood how she felt, but I hated to see her so bitter and so hurt and nowhere to go with it. Nothing positive to apply it to. I wanted to help her, but I didn't know how, and it was only going to. And I was only going to be there for a hot minute. The only thing that perked her up was the struggle that women got into of uh, got into to improve medical care at the jail. Mm -hmm. And that part for me was very powerful because mm -hmm. you know as colonized black as colonized Africans here in America and you know colonized people all over the world were taught well, not necessarily even taught. It's imposed upon us by, you know, white uh, colonial school systems and, you know, just anything that you, any type of propaganda that you see is just based in this thing that um, if you get an education, if you go to school, if you do all of these different things, you'll be able to, you know, follow your dreams and right. live the life that you want to. But the pain, the frustration that Charlie you know, is displaying here um, in this portion of the chapter is something that we've all, you know, experienced as colonized people. Absolutely. And just to say, I went to a four-year college, graduated with a degree, and I wasn't even able to use that degree until I joined a revolutionary organization. Yeah. And, you know, you, get, you graduate, you get this degree, they want you to have so many years of you know, experience before you get an actual job wow, versus some yeah. white, some white cracker boy or girl who just knows somebody in the corporation who dad, whose dad is like a boss or something like that. They're guaranteed a position. And it's just like, yeah, I, I'm recalling when I used to work for, you know, I'm <clears throat> do certain type of work for children mm -hmm. used to. And then there was um, an organization that I worked for where this um, white woman, she was my supervisor, mm -hmm. and not even that, but it was just that the requirements were that, you know, at least for the supervisory position, you were to have a high school, well, no, not even, you had to have a college degree mm -hmm. to even get like a job just as a caseworker. Mm -hmm. she, she didn't even have a high school diploma. 
And wow. we found that out like through the grapevine and it was likely to be true. Matter of fact, a client actually told me because he was raised, mm -hmm. he knew her. Mm -hmm. So he was like, last time I heard, like she never even graduated high school, mm -hmm. but this is a white woman. Yeah. So it was just like, you know, yeah, you can, th there are exceptions made for, for white people or colonizers all over the place, but then you got, Africans and colonized people, they can have all the accreditations in the world and they still scrapping to survive. Yeah. And and it's just like, you know, I, I, I can say if, if there is a such, well, I'll just say how fortunate it was for me to be able to go to, well, to get this knowledge, you know, and then be able to bring it back, right. you know, to forward the revolution. And it's not to say, you know, if you do, if you do have a degree, if you do have, um, you know, uh, some type of skill, mm -hmm. you know, that it, it should be put back into the struggle for liberation for your people. Because, I mean, you can have all the doctorates, you can have all the degrees in the world, but that's not going to stop you from getting shot down in the street if you're pulled over by some pig. It's not going to stop you from, you know, having to worry about the safety of your children each and every single time that they go, you know, that they leave out of the house to go do something. Absolutely. And, you know, that's something that we, you know, that we have to consciously fight against because, again, capitalism, white imperialism will feed you this idea that if you, you know, if you just uh, do all of these different things, like the sister said, jump through all of these different hoops, yeah. that you will be okay. But there's no comfortable place in colonialism. There's no comfortable place in capitalism. And, you know, just if you do decide to, if I knew what I, if I knew then what I know now, I, I would not have gone to school. And you talking about debt, like $40,000 up in debt. <laughs> You know, that a degree that I don't even have, I don't even have with me. And I couldn't even get the damn degree because I owed the school a balance. They wouldn't give me the, they gave me, and that's the, this is the shade, girl. Um. <laughs> this is a shade. So they gave me, they gave me the casing for the degree. But they said in order for me to get my actual paper degree, I had to pay off the balance that I owed to the school. <laughs> See. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's just important that even now that we instill in our children that this whole Amer this idea of the American dream is bullshit. It's bullshit. It should don't so, apply to them. <laughs> so hashtag read that back. Let's get into this. Uh, get into these comments to see what you guys' um, favorite part of chapter 14 was. We have Comrade Valencia who says, uh, that's common in the workplace for white people to... Uh, hold on, let's see. It's common in the workplace for white people to have no high school diploma or at best a GED, but are put in supervisory positions yep. over black people who are more educated than them. Yup. The shade of it all. The oppression of it all. <laughs> Let's see what else we have here. Uh, we have Comrade Daniel who says, I learned more from wandering the streets and reading Fanon and Huey after I dropped out of college. Period. Mm -hmm. We got Conrad Kimmy who says a true, true, a white man out of prison finds a job more quickly Absolutely. than a black man with a degree. That's true. Let's see. Oh, are we respond? I see we got some response to a comment. Okay, so we have Conrad Histopher who says hashtag read. Come on, stupid thing. What did I just do? Uh -oh. Hold on, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, we have Comrade Histopher who says, hashtag read that back. Black people trying to avoid jury duty instead of slowing down the railroad. Oh, that was another important part of the chapter as well, too, on page 223. Mm -hmm. um, she said, it may, well, he said, it made me think of the cases I sat on in the power of money. Yes. Yeah. We have uh, Skuzat with the Cutters. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but he says, the prison industrial complex is the mental isolation of the society. Uh, 
listen again. And he says, I am, uh, come on, I am one that always believe that it's not the prison industrial complex that keeps us down, nor is it the Jim Crow. I'm not even going into all of that. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, like yeah. <laughs> uh, Somebody might pay, the, pay the trolls, y'all. Pay the trolls. But, um, okay, so yeah, that's what did you, um, okay, yeah, you did do your hashtag, mm-hmm. read that back part for chapter 14. Okay. So, um, yeah, we can move on to chapter 15. Dang, it, I, it's, I feel like it was something else I wanted to comment on, but I can't think right now. But, um, okay, so yeah, if we don't have any more hashtag read that back comments here, um, we're going to go to chapter uh, 15, which was, woo! Mm. <laughs> But again, uh, first, I just want to remind all of our viewers that the Revolutionary Book Club is a fundraiser and a a member drive for the Black Hammer organization. So again, we invite you to donate to support the Revolutionary Book Club, support um, Black Hammer. Um, You can donate through Cash App at BH Book Club. You can also go through uh, GoFundMe at GoFundMe.com slash Black Hammer org, or you can go to BlackHammer.org to donate donate through that as well and um become a member at five dollars a month just five dollars a month and you know support the revolution support your freedom support your children's freedom so all right so moving on to chapter 15 this is uh when uh comrade asada decides that she's going to join the black panther party Mm -hmm. So um, she speaks about, you know, just her initial visit there. You know how she gets there. Um, I just want to put a disclaimer out there real quick. Um, Conrad Asada really reads the hell out of the Black Panther Party in this chapter. She does. (laughs) And, um, you know, not to... It definitely doesn't take away from anything that the the that even what the Black Panther Party represents right now. But just the the principled in the the principled criticism mm-hmm. that Comrade Asada lays out in this chapter of the uh you know of the Black Panther Party is really astounding and it was just like damn so, um yeah. <laughs> she went in really already criticizing yeah, them. Just, yeah. <laughs> So she's um, she's joining right now at this point where they have the Panther 21 that's on trial right now. And each of them that are on trial have a $100,000 bail on their hands right now. So she's speaking about that. And when she enters the party, she comes into the vision of the medical cadre. So she's working with um, the sister that is, you know, doing the free TV testing. They're giving mm-hmm. out information about um, sickle cell anemia mm-hmm. and things like that as well. Um, even early, early on in the chapter, I don't even think. Th- okay, so she joined one day, then the next day she got expelled. Expelled. Yeah. (laughs) The very next day she got expelled and she was expelled because she had newspapers, you know, you know, the Panther, Panthers had a newspaper or whatever. And so she left the stack of them um, on a desk or something like that. So it was this comrade by the name of, um, what was his name? Uh, Robert B. Yeah. Okay. So she sat her papers down on a desk or something and he threw them away so she snapped yeah she straight snapped <laughs> and so you know he didn't this brother didn't even have the balls to tell her that he expelled her so she goes to the office the next day yeah. and the person who's at the front was like um, yeah girl you you expelled you ain't you not you even supposed to be here so anyway, they got that situation. She was reinstated back into the party or whatever. And then um, she speaks about the breakfast program that she was a part of mm-hmm. and how she had to be there every day at 430. And I believe she said the first day she was assigned, she overslept. Yeah. So she gave herself criticism in a meeting or whatever. And then she was directed to be on the 
the bre the free breakfast um, for the rest of her time as a member of um, the party. Excuse me, Gap. So, um, yeah, so she speaks about that. And one of the main criticisms that uh, Comrade Asada has are, you know, well, has or had of the party was the political education yeah. um, of the Black Panther Party. And, you know, that's something, you know, that's very, that's something very, very extremely important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just even us having this discussion now, having the Revolutionary Book Club, having this political education, you know, she just speaks about, you know, if, you know, if people aren't informed, you know, about what they're fighting against or even how to fight it, then you are ill-equipping the people. Mm -hmm. And she lays out, you know, how most of the political education wasn't, you know, they didn't have any um, historical context to, um, you know, anything that was being taught. She speaks about how it was an African from the continent who brought in a calendar to the office. And on the calendar, it said... Um, what did she say? It says... Uh, it didn't say intercommunalist. It yeah. said international. Inter so she took... She said it was a badass calendar. The calendar was beautiful. So she hung it up. But when she came into the office the next morning, it was gone. And she asked the guy, you know, the brother who was there, where's the calendar? And he was like, the calendar said international. We're not internationalists. We're intercom intercommunalists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was just evidence of, you know, the lack of... Understanding. Yeah, understanding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the serious... I almost want to say even the... Well, not necessarily the seriousness because obviously they had to take political education seriously. But right. just the... Um, the political strength of, you know, what was being taught wasn't there. It wasn't, you know, like a foundation, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, um, let me see. It was something else that she said there when she was discussing the political education. It says, I thought it was a real shame the Black Panther Party didn't teach Panthers organizing and mobilizing techniques. Mm -hmm. Some members were na natural geniuses at organizing people, but they were usually the busiest comrades with the most responsibility. Yeah. And how many times do we find that in an organization, <clears throat> one that has I mean, great attentions to do all this stuff, but uh, you need people that you know can be trained to know what they're doing in the community and she just she witnessed that where it was just like I mean you got all these people here who are they know what they're doing they go out in the streets they get shit done but then <laughs> you know they can't really take on much more and then you got the new comrades that may come in that they don't know what the hell they're doing right. but they haven't received the training or the guidance on how to go out and and learn to take on that same load mm -hmm. um and everything and I thought that was that was pretty deep yeah and that was, a, I mean, a good criticism to bring about. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, like, without political education, I mean, you can have the the will and, you know, the fight power to go out and want to, mm -hmm. you know, destroy white imperialism. But that's like, you know, having the gun and not knowing what to do it. with it or how to use it. Absolutely. Because, I mean, any of us can go out and, you know, shoot a pig or you know do anything you know anything of that nature but to what end like what is that what is that leading us to right. you know so um she so she speaks about that and she also speaks about um this friend that she made well this comrade um, by the name of uh, Zay, Zay, Zay. Is it Zaid? I'm not Zaid. sure how to say it either. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> so um, she spoke about, she speaks about her relationship with him. And um, she also goes into her, um, you know, into her criticism of Huey P. Newton. <laughs> mm -hmm. And just how um, she wasn't a very, she wasn't a big fan of his speeches or, you know, like, <laughs> no, how not. he spoke and um she even says uh what did she say <laughs> <laughs> the problem was that somebody had forgotten to tell these oppressed no i'm sorry uh, <clears throat> even worse almost no one understood huey's long speeches explaining intercommunalism huey newton was not what you call a good speaker in fact he had a kind of high-pitched, monotonous voice, and his rambling for three hours about the negation of the negation 
was sheer disaster. People walked out in droves. Instead of criticizing what was happening, most of the party members defended it. When I said that Huey needed speaking lessons, they jumped down my throat. When Huey changed his title from defense minister to the ridiculous sounding supreme commander and then to the even more ridiculous supreme servant, damn near nobody said a word. That was one of the big problems in the party. Now this is where she really get into it. Criticism and self-criticism were not encouraged and the little that was given often was not taken seriously. Constructive criticism and self-criticism are extremely important for any revolutionary organization. Without them, people tend to drown in their mistakes, not learn from them. That was extremely, important. extremely Just important. So important. Yeah. Um, I highlighted that <laughs> because um, it's you know it doesn't ever feel good to have to give a self-criticism mm -mm. <laughs> but they are so necessary because yes. in the fact that she saw that you know um it's just the the significance of how she recognized it even then being fairly new to the party at that mm -hmm. point um knowing that self-criticism and criticism are how important they are and how they can how they can forward a revolution or how they can kill one really mm -hmm. or a revolutionary organization anyway because if you can't come forward and say these are the things that I know that we're doing wrong, mm -hmm. or this is how we're this is how we're not reaching the people, mm -hmm. or did you see how what you know we need to have a discussion about the last speech that Huey had? Mm -hmm. Why were all those people leaving yeah. at the time that they were leaving? I mean they, I mean especially if they felt like there was something substantive in what he was saying mm -hmm. that needed to be heard. Mm -hmm. Um, so a criticism would have needed to be given in order for them to say, okay, now that we have the criticism list, what can we do to change that? Mm -hmm. Should we have somebody else that can speak? Yeah. So people just ain't good speakers. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And you know, you know, that's not even to, that's not to even take away from anything right. that Huey P. Newton did. Mm -hmm. If anything, criticism and self-criticism is, it should, how it should be used, it should be used in a way to uplift the leadership to improve not even just the leadership but your other comrade or any of your comrades so they in turn become better comrades absolutely so um yeah she asked she was she a, a big part of this chapter um i feel like is when she's speaking about her relationship with comrade zaid mm -hmm. and a lot of these criticisms that she had of the black panther party you know she laid out to him um mm -hmm. she even speaks about um her him coming over to her house for them to have this discussion you know where she just basically voiced you know all of these things to him and you know she was very she says that um she was uh she was upset because once she laid out what how she was feeling like Zaid just closed up on her like almost she couldn't understand if he was upset with her right or you know of anything and you know um yeah so later on we find out that you know Zaid was in a position to where he couldn't really act upon what um she what she said mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> Conrad Gazi says, I remember a certain old leader who that would put people in sleep. <laughs> to put people to sleep. <laughs> Look at that speech. Mm. <laughs> so, anyway, um, she's speaking about that, but anyway, at this um, point, um, Huey P. Newton has expelled the Panther 21 from the party because they sent a letter saying, you know, criticizing him and he wanted them out of the party. Right. And so Zaid at this point was trying to play like peacemaker between Huey P. Newton and the um, Panther uh, 20, the Panther 21. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a part in the chapter where she speaks about how Zaid you know, um, snaps on this comrade because they felt like he was being subjective because of the next person that they were going to use the money that they raised to get them out of prison. Um, when 
one of his brothers, Zaid's brother, blood brother. was blood brother was one of the Panthers twenty one. Mm -hmm. But here it is, he he was struggling for this other comrade to get out because he knew how influential, how powerful this his this brother was versus his real brother. And that's like some real, that's some real revolutionary ass shit right there. He had mentioned uh, when he was discussing that, he said that this brother had specific skills mm -hmm. that were in dire need mm -hmm. to the organization. Mm -hmm. So that's why they were fighting to get that brother out and not his own blood brother. Yeah. So that, to, to me, I was like, yeah, that yeah. would be subjective. He was trying to get his own brother mm -hmm. out rather than this brother that they needed because they needed his skills. Yeah, that was, that was extremely um uh, uh, uh objective talking about mm -hmm. subjective that was extremely mm -hmm. objective um so um yeah so i'm I, instead of i'm gonna read what uh comrade uh what comrade asada says because at this point again she doesn't understand why why exactly why zaid is acting this way or even Though she was criticizing Huey P. Newton for doing all of these unnecessary expulsions and stuff like that, she didn't understand exactly what was happening until, you know, towards the end of this chapter, she says, I'm going to read it. She says, Zaid was acting as a peacemaker between Huey and the Panther 21, furiously, I'm, I'm on page 231. Yeah. Um, furiously trying to get Huey to, to rescind his expulsion sure. order. Zaid felt that to take any position in reference to problems within the party might jeopardize his role and result in dire consequences for the Panther 21. Situeo and Doruba, who had not been expelled because they were out on bail and had not signed the letter, were also attempting to get the Panther 21 reinstated. They were under a lot of pressure from both sides. Huey wanted them to support the expulsion and the expelled Panthers wanted them to criti criticize Huey's action. Mm -hmm. Like Zaid, Set and Doruba honestly believed they could straighten out the madness. And were it not for the FBI, they probably could have. Nobody back then had ever heard of the counterintelligence program set up by the FBI. Uh, FBI. Nobody could have possibly known, have known that the FBI had sent a phony letter to Eldridge Cleaver in Alger sound, signed by the Panther 21 criticizing Huey Newton's leadership. No one could have known that the FBI had sent a letter to Huey's brother saying that the New York Panthers were plotting to kill him. Nobody could have known that the FBI's <laughs> COINTELPRO was attempting to destroy the Black Panther Party in particular and the Black Liberation Movement in general using divide and conquer tactics. Mm -hmm. The FBI's COINTEL program consisted of turning members of organizations against each other, pitting one black organization against another. Huey ended up suspending Set and Doruba from the party, branded them as enemies of the people, and caused them to go into hiding in fear of their very lives. No one had the slightest idea that this whole scenario was carefully manipulated and orchestrated by the FBI. Heavy. That was some very heavy shit right there. And, you know, just upon <coughs> reading that, it just makes you think of how further... The panther, the panthers could be like right now in 2019. Like, what have we could, what could we have achieved? You know, up until this point, you know, without the intervention of the FBI, the Cointel program. Yeah, and it just like all of that that she laid out right there. That is, you know, if these types of things weren't written, and for us to kind of understand like what's been done in the past to destroy like revolutionary groups such as the Black Panther Party, even with the things that they might have been doing wrong on their mm -hmm, own. Mm -hmm. But the things that, you know, took place, it's so important that we're reading this because that's how you know, like, okay, these are the tactics that have been used before. Mm -hmm, so this mm -hmm. is how we can protect ourselves now um, when we have the revolutionary groups we have today. I mean, it's just, it's really, really heavy. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about, I mean, the Panthers that lost their lives mm -hmm. or who are still rotting away in prison, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's just, it's just really heavy to read 
that to see how this all unfolded. Mm -hmm. um, people say Cointel Pro, and they just think, oh yeah, it was heavy. But it was just, it was so because it'd be the people. Like I mean, <clears throat> somewhere in here she talks about somebody who was in the Panther Party who they learned was an FBI cotton. undercover. Yeah, Cotton. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Who was this? He was working for the the police undercover, mm -hmm. uh, and he was working on this project to re to build up our what was it? To, the, um, was it the medical? No. Well, yeah, it was the building that the Panther Party had purchased to put the free medical clinic in mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And she was just speaking about how he was always drunk. You know, mm -hmm. every time, you know, people were just, members of the party were just telling her, yeah, girl, he doing the work, he doing what he's supposed to do. And every time she would go over there, nothing, it, will, be done, nothing yeah. will be done. And then it later comes out after she goes to the office and she's told by uh, the, the brother that's working there that he doesn't feel good or whatever. So she mm -hmm. schedules him a uh schedules him a doctor's appointment that he ultimately doesn't go to and so right. now cotton is fighting to get um asada expelled because he's saying that when the brother told asada about you know how he was feeling that she didn't do nothing you know which they later find out that it was a lie and that mm -hmm. this this bitch ass nigga mm -hmm. was an operative of the state absolutely because so. he i mean not only that he had everybody mad at her mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they were saying, oh, well, you know, we were told that you didn't do anything for mm -hmm. this brother when he came to you and said he wasn't feeling well. Uh, and so it's so important to pay attention to those types of things yeah. uh, because people, I mean, they will look just like you. Mm -hmm. and Sound just like you. Goddamn pig. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and something does not feel right. It's mm -hmm. just important to pay attention to that. Yeah. So. I, I'm well. I'm almost sorry because the the part about the Cointel program that was my hashtag read that back part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can do you have a hashtag uh, read that back? <laughs> I think we we kind of covered mine already too because we talked about uh, what did I highlight? <clears throat> I mean, I highlighted pretty much all of her criticisms because mm -hmm. I thought they were important to yeah. kind of recognize um, for today. And then uh, we talked about the political education and. Uh, how she reviewed it. you read it already so mm -hmm. that was that was my hashtag reading, Black right? Fire. <laughs> Okay, so let's see what Conrad was speaking about in the comments. We have Conrad Histopher, hashtag read that back. FBI COINTEL program consists mm -hmm. of turning members of organizations against each other, pitting one black organization against the other. Yes, black power. Uh, let's uh, we also have Conrad Daniel who says, hashtag read that back about Cointel Pro. Cointel Pro. Wow. Yeah. Um, then we have uh, Conrad Kimya who says, my finger's so clumsy, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. You want to read that one? Kimya says, um, that's my read, my read that back. Read that back. The Quinto Pro interface in Black Panther Party it is knowledge that is truly useful today, especially in the Black Identity Extremist designation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I like what you said earlier about, you know, just understanding what the COINTEL program is because, you know, being a member of Black Hammer, mm -hmm. you know, or any, uh, you know, revolutionary organization, it helps you to be vigilant, vigilant yeah. you know, and security conscious about anything that comes across your desk because, like, we understand how petty and conniving the state can be. Mm -hmm. You know, to look at this, that's like high school ass shit. But yeah. it's so, you don't understand the, the, the gravity or, you know, the power that something that we would concede to be so petty of what it can actually do to, you know, an organization. And, you know, just to to have that understanding and to... Um, you know, just know this nature of the state, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, and the tactics they'll use, I mean, one example would be that somebody <clears throat> would, might say, it might be a concept that the person has. Walking, some people honestly just don't know any better when they come into the revolutionary walk where they they think, oh yeah, well this is okay, like, I, I'm trying to think of an example. But like um, ADOS, for example, mm -hmm. might be something. Somebody would come in and think that that's Gosh. something that we would support or that would be something that would be harmless. 
But then when you also look at, um, there are people that come into groups and their idea from the very start is to use something like that to, to as a poison to spit out to mm -hmm. the other people of the organization where they just, you know, yeah, why would they say that this isn't something that we should do? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and then before you know it, you got this rift between in your, that's just an example, mm -hmm. a good example I could think of, but it's important to pay attention to that and to call things like that out mm -hmm. and why they're problematic and, and gain an understanding of unity around certain concepts. Not that you're trying to necessarily force somebody how to think, but it's important to understand that these things, how, how dangerous some certain types of narratives and rhetoric can be. To a revolutionary group, and um, they use those tactics because they know some people just don't know. Yeah. So um, I think that's really important to keep an eye to be vigilant on things like that. Black power. Alrighty, y'all. So we've come to the end of today's show, and I'm so 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 happy to have my comrade Knight with me going forward. I hope you guys have enjoyed her as well too. Um, so we have six chapters left. Wow, two more weeks. Um, only two more weeks, y'all. And this has been such a great, um, uh, I guess you can say journey. Yes. <laughs> or whatever. Um, you know, being able to have, you know, these discussions to, you know, um, get to know Conrad Asada in this way and to, you know, be able to have political education for the people it's just mm -hmm. just really 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 great so again just really want to remind you all support the book uh the book club support black hammer cash app bh book club gofundme.com slash black hammer or go to black hammer org dot uh well black hammer dot org to donate there and um just to let you all know if you didn't Conrad Naya is the chief of membership, so I'm going to turn it over to her. With that being said, <laughs> um, I am going to extend an invitation for people to join Black Hammer today. Um, you can uh, comment that you want to learn more or that you want um, to just talk to us about how you can join but i need people who want to join to put up a fist right black now fist. black power mm -hmm. fist mm -hmm. right now um in the comments and i will be in contact with you um or even if you just want to learn more about you know the organization and we can extend that to, um we can let you know how to do that as well but if you are interested in learning more or becoming a member of black hammer please put a fist in the comments oh we got, got one, one. Black Power all right cool <laughs> so i will be in contact with you um and even if you watch the playback Put, just know that if you put a fist in the comments, I'm going to be in contact with you um, so that you can um, so that you can join. Uh, we have so many different committees that you can be a part of. Uh, you can be a part of this committee. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be a part. I mean, we do a lot of we do, we do a lot of ill shit. So yeah. you can you can really <laughs> just, you know, really, really be a part of the revolution and whatever it is that you can contribute. So. Put a fist in the comments. Let us know that you are interested. We will be in contact with you because we got to grow. Yes. Um, so earlier, before we went live, I was having a conversation with Conrad Naya. And this came to me while I was brushing my teeth this morning. So, <laughs> um, you know, in Black Hammer, we ain't with that bourgeoisie type shit. Petty bourgeoisie, nothing like that. We are stone cold, working class, African people fighting to get free. Yep. So we know we call it the Revolutionary Book Club, mm -hmm. but I was thinking calling it the Revolutionary Book Trap. <laughs> you know, like how you got trap house. So the Revolutionary Book Trap. We in the we in the Revolutionary Book Trap. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I but we, can, we, we can talk about it. If you like that name, let me see you put your let me see you put a black fist in the in the comment section. If you like the revolutionary book trap, we didn't know book club. When you think of book club, you think of some high sedity, you know, white people sitting around in a circle, monotone voice, just speaking, mm -hmm. answering questions about unseasoned so, yeah. everything. <laughs> 
everything all over. <laughs> just bland, 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 bland. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm a, we gonna discuss it with the the, the book club committee, <laughs> and then we we we'll, we'll bring it back. But the revolutionary book trap. I like that. I'm with it. I'm, I'm with it too. <laughs> but y'all come back next Sunday, 11 a.m. We're going to be doing uh, chapters 16 through 18. Uh, we're getting we're getting close. We're getting close to the end, y'all. We're getting we we we're getting to the end. Um, so we're probably uh, what's today's date? The 28th. Yeah. This Sunday we'll be announcing the next book that we'll be reading for the Revolutionary Book Club. So make sure you tune in for that. Um, we have comrades Gigi and Robert that will provide you with the free PDF to the books that we're reading. So make sure you tune in. Find out how you can get the book and. Black power, y'all. Black power. <laughs>